Okay, enough of that noise. Welcome. This is Chapter 1, Monetary Policy on NyQuil by Jeremy Chiquette. This is the first chapter out of the textbook for the Money and Banking course, um, also written by Jeremy Chiquette, yours truly. Uh, one thing to get out of the way, uh, starting off. So every single video lecture I make, I like to put some kind of music at the beginning of it, because, you know, like, why, why the hell not? You know, music's always cool. Everyone loves music. And so as a result... Um, YouTube gets kind of mad if I try to use somebody else's music, so I just started putting my own music in there instead. So that, that explains the music that you heard that you probably never heard before because, uh, well, up until a few days ago, it didn't even exist. Um, and so, yeah, there's uh, music stuff there. Hooray! Now, obviously, I'm something of a vain narcissist here, so let's talk a little bit about me, shall we? Now... I graduated from Clemson University in May of this year with a PhD in economics. My focus was in macroeconomics. Uh, all three of my fields for the PhD were in macro-related something or other. Uh, no, I'm going to go ahead and say this right now. You do not have to call me Dr. Chiquette. In fact, please don't call me Dr. Chiquette. Uh, Jeremy does just fine. My narcissism apparently has some limits, uh, and that's at least something somewhat... <laughs> Excuse me, that sneeze was brought to you by my cat, Odo, who's sitting on my lap and keeping me company while I give this lecture. Anyways, uh, the limits to my vain narcissism are at least epsilon below having to call me Dr. Chiquette. Uh, just call me Jeremy. I'm not much older than you guys, and honestly, I, I kind of just prefer Jeremy. Um, so, enough about that. My main focus of research is in monetary policy, namely unconventional monetary policy. Basically, everything that happened at the Federal Reserve after the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. Uh, we'll be talking about that probably as the semester closes, is my guess. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the monetary theory before we actually get into uh, some of the more recent developments of monetary policy in the United States and across the rest of the world, because... There was some pretty interesting stuff, but we need to discuss the theory before we can really play around with the application of some of this stuff. Now, <clears throat> so really since I've done plenty of research in monetary stuff, this is kind of a dream come true for me to be able to teach this course. Um, it's something I've always wanted to do once I started monetary, uh, once I started my research in it, my really like my dream was to be able to teach a monetary econ related course like money and banking. So this is kind of fun stuff for me, um, and honestly, I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I'm enjoying it right now. Um, should make for a pretty fun semester, I think. Now, let's just go ahead and get started now, once I'm uh, kind of done introducing myself, being a vain narcissist and all that crap. Uh, let's talk about what money is. So what is money? Well, dollars, maybe? Who knows? Uh, well, actually, it's not. It's kind of excluding other currencies, like picking that one kid last in your kickball team in gym class. And, you know, of course, I was never that kid. I never knew the pain of being picked last, who's just sort of standing there alone, and, you know, both teams start fighting over who's not going to get me. I mean, that kind of sucked. Um, never never happened to me. Don't worry about it. So does currency work, maybe? Well, yeah, I, maybe, but what about bank reserves? Currency and bank reserves are not the same thing, and currency and bank reserves play a role in money. What about deposits? Can't leave them out. Well, maybe it's getting kind of obvious that money is more than just currency. So let's hop over to Wikipedia, 1.22 a.m., August 10th, 2020, see what the definition is. Well, according to Wikipedia, at that point in time, uh, at least from what I remember seeing, this was, you know, while I took my NyQuil but was waiting for it to kick in so the pink elephants hadn't shown up, started telling me how to conduct monetary policy yet. Money is any item or verifiable record that's generally accepted as payment for goods and services and repayment of debts in a particular country or socioeconomic context. Okay, great, but what the hell does that mean? What makes money money? Um, does Eddie Money make money money? No, he just makes really bad 80s songs about having two tickets to paradise, which obviously aren't going to cut it. So let's, let's maybe try this one again a little bit. We'll, we'll bypass some bad 80s references and we'll just cut straight into some monetary policy. Well, money has to be something to meet, you know, a couple of, or money has to meet a couple of requirements in order to actually be called money. These are called functions of money. <clears throat> Basically, it's the purpose that money serves. 
better way to think of it is just simply asking, what does money need to be able to do to be called money? And well, it's got to satisfy four functions. If it can do these four things, then it's money. So function number one, it has to be a medium of exchange. This makes money an intermediary in trade. Suppose you got two cows, your neighbor's got 20 pigs. You want a pig, your neighbor's willing to trade with you. Maybe your neighbor wants some beef or something like that. Who knows? If there was no money, you'd have to give him a cow for a pig. Now, if you think a cow is worth a pig, you're great. If you don't, you're screwed. Definitely screwed. You're not effed. So, if you think a cow is worth 10 pigs, then you'd have to trade that one cow for 10 pigs. And you have nine more pigs than what you wanted. An alternative is take the L in the cow, lose 90% of your wealth just to get a pig. Well, it's not really worth all that much. The other, or the other idea would be to wait it out until you slaughter one of your cows and trade some cuts for a pig. But, you know, what if you got like a hot date coming over and you want like a nice slow roasted pork loin? Um, you don't have any money. You just have two cows. Then you're sort of screwed because you're going to slaughter your cow in a month. But this hot date's coming over Friday. Looks like you don't get to impress your hot date with how well you cook a slow roasted pork tenderloin. Um, either way, the economy's going to lose out on some value here. Not good. But now let's say you had one cow and money that was worth a second cow. Well, you could just buy the pig and not lose any real value. The economy's going to be fine because money's much more divisible than the goods that it represents. This makes exchange much easier. So if we want a nice example of a tra oh, never mind, shady drug dealer, we're just going to move on. Now, money in this case means you don't need the double coincidence of wants, which is where you and the other person value your items equally, and both of you want the other item. That kind of really only happens by chance. It's not a particularly easy thing to make happen. Now, money also has to be a unit of account. What does that mean? Well, unit of money is used to represent real goods and services. If I think a dollar will buy me a soda and a dollar buys me a soda, well, then it meets a unit of account. So one dollar purchasing me a soda means that it's going to serve the purpose of being a unit of account. Oh, we're just going to totally bypass. These are just getting wonderful. They're just getting worse and worse as we go on. We got drug deals, we have prostitution, and we have illicit weapons trade. This is... Um, yeah. Well, I, I would say this is a, an excellent introduction to the course. Okay, let's talk next. Money's got to be a store of value. What does that mean? Well, you sell someone a bunch of guns, the money you earn today better be worth at least something tomorrow. If inflation's rapidly eroding away the purchasing power of your money, so like, you know, a dollar today is worth only a quarter tomorrow, well, it, money doesn't really store much value. It's kind of losing a lot of value, which is... Kind of why central banks like to monitor inflation so closely and so carefully. Now, the last thing money has to be is a standard of deferred payment. It means money can settle a debt. The drug dealer wants that kid he gave the weed to to compensate him. Money can do it. The arms dealer, Nicolas Cage, looking super awesome in sunglasses, selling the AK-47, decides to give the guns to the buyer the only partial payment, and that money better be able to settle their debts in the future. Because, well, if you don't, in a black market, um, bad things might happen. It's kind of hard to bring the law in to enforce payment disputes in an illegal transaction. Um, go like, oh, hey, cool. Guess what, guys? Coppers, over here. I sold him a bunch of weapons illegally, and uh, he didn't pay me. And the police will go, oh, why, thank you for telling us about this. We'll take care of it immediately. And then they arrest both of you. So, enough about that. Let's talk about what makes up the money supply. Well, money's got various principal components. The first one is the money base, total reserves plus currency. We'll talk about what total reserves are in just a second. And we can just talk about what they are now. Total reserves are the sum of required and excess reserves. So whenever you go to a bank and deposit some money, that money will go into their reserves. Their total reserves are the sum of the reserves that the bank are required to store. Let's say 10% of every deposit has to be stored in case somebody else wants to come in and withdraw some money. Those would be required reserves. The other 90% of what you deposited would be excess reserves. So if we allow a deposit component, call it D, 
to exist, then we would have this lowercase rr plus lowercase er plus lowercase c being the ratio components of the deposit component. So ER is ratio of excess reserves to deposits, or the share of excess reserves that make up deposits. We would have RR being the ratio of required reserves to deposits that banks have to hold. And then C would be currency, or the ratio of currency to deposits. So once we remove D from each individual component in the equation, RR, ER, and C are all fractions that just add up to one. And then we just multiply that by the demand, or I don't know why I say demand, deposit component. This is like the third or fourth attempt at making this video, and I've said demand every single time, and I don't know why I'm doing it. It's just whatever. Moving on. D here is ultimately a scalar. Whatever this deposit component, I got it right that time, is, well, it's just going to scale up what's going on with the money base. Now, the money base is not technically part of the money supply. It's got one component that is a part of the money supply, which is currency, but reserves are not part of the money supply. So the first actual measure of the money supply that we have here is M1. Now, M1 is the measure of the money supply that's got currency, physical money, like stuff that you carry around you know, in your back pocket, as well as checking accounts, demand deposits, and negotiable order of withdrawal accounts. And it is equal to what you see right here. So if we look all the way to the right on this, we've got 1 plus C divided by RR plus ER plus C multiplied by M0, which is the money base. What we're doing is we're removing, or sort of, yeah, I guess you could say removing, the required reserve and the excess reserve components, but we're keeping 1 plus the currency component of the money base. Now, this is an example of what's known as the money multiplier. The broad monetary aggregate is expressed as a multiplier of 1 plus C divided by the non-deposit component of the money base, which is what you saw all the way on the right-hand side of the equations that you saw. ER is determined by the Federal Reserve's policies on discount lending. Excess reserves, basically the amount that banks get to lend out, is determined by Fed policy because they set the required reserve ratio. And then the currency, <coughs> that sneeze also brought to you by my beautiful cat, Odo. I'm only mildly allergic to cats, which is kind of strange considering I've got four. <coughs> Last sneeze, at least for the next couple of minutes, I hope. So this currency component is determined by the public. They decide how much money they want to carry around with them. Now, if we move up to the next measure of the money supply, we have M2, which is the total of M1 plus some other stuff. Most savings accounts, <coughs> money market accounts, retail money market mutual funds, and small denomination time deposits. If we go to M3, it's an even broader measure because it includes M1 plus M2 plus CDs or certificates of deposit, not those things that existed. God, I am so sorry about this. Not those things that existed like in the 1990s, you know, back in the Stone Age when your parents were probably listening to that stuff going like, oh man, you know, this new uh, like Ace of Base album is awesome or this new Corn album is great. Um, I may or may not have existed in that decade and I may or may not have owned a Corn album or two, uh, much to my now dismay <clears throat> and absolute shame. Institutional money market mutual fund balances, deposits of euro dollars, repurchase agreements, and so much more. What happens is we can see the as the measures of the money supply increase, we go from M1 to M2 to M3, they get broader and broader and broader. Now, the way that they're ordered is by liquidity. The term liquidity refers to the availability of liquid assets to a market, company, etc., Liquidity is basically cash. Oh, and by the way, those sniffles are brought to you by allergies, not a cocaine addiction. Don't worry. <clears throat> so liquidity is basically cash. The more easily an asset can be converted into cold, hard cash, the more liquid it's considered to be. Therefore, cash is the most liquid asset of all. So we talked about 
the functions money has to serve. We've talked about <coughs> what makes up the money supply. Now let's talk about how money actually gets created because in the United States we use something that's referred to as fractional reserve banking. And it has something to do with the required and excess reserve components of the money base. So let's say you go to a bank with $10,000. You deposit that $10,000 into the bank. Now that bank has the reserve requirement which was set by the Federal Reserve, meaning the bank must keep some fraction of every deposit in the vault in case somebody else wants to come in and withdraw their money. So let's just go ahead and say, just to make things easy on everyone, the reserve ratio is 10%. <clears throat> that means the bank has to keep $1,000 and they can loan out $9,000. Whoever the bank lent that money to is invariably just going to end up depositing it somewhere else. So let's say new bank gets the full $9,000 deposit. They can lend out $8,100, keeping nine or 900 in the vault. <clears throat> well, the first time, nine grand just got created. Now, 8,100 got created. So we got 9,000 plus 8,100 just being created. This technically goes on forever. Why? Because it's an infinite sum. So what we're looking at here is delta MS is the change in the money supply is equal to the money multiplier times the change in deposits. So MM is the money multiplier, like I said. Now if we let ER be the amount that we can lend out and DV the initial deposit in the bank, it's going to look something like this. You're probably going to be like, oh my god, what the hell did he just show me? Well, the change in the money supply is equal to this infinite sum as I goes from zero up to infinity of the excess reserve component to the power of I <coughs> times the initial deposit. Now if we expand it out, we get something kind of like this. So we can see ER to the zero plus ER to the first plus ER to the second, so on and so forth. Remember, ER is less than one. So every single time we raise that to a higher power, that number is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, if the reserve requirement is 10%, we can lend out 90% of that, meaning ER is equal to 0.9 of every deposit. If the deposit's $10,000, D equals 10,000, then we can express the infinite sum as the following. You got this. <clears throat> and we would multiply that infinite sum by D. Now, it's a geometric series, and for those of you that have had calculus too, I'm sorry to be bringing back horrible, horrible flashbacks. Um, I personally love math more than just about anything in the world. Uh, there's a few things I like more than math. Econ's one of them. But uh, even I despised calculus, too. That was the probably the hardest class I've ever taken in my life. Um, and, well, infinite series were a part of Calc, too. And, yeah, much of my dismay when I saw some of this stuff, I was like, oh, my God, why is, it, why, why is this happening again? And then I realized, well, it's kind of already been done for you. They just kind of explain what the theory is and you move on. Um... So this being a geometric series, reserve ratio is less than 1, the infinite geometric series converges to a finite number, namely 1 over 1 minus ER or 1 over RR. So if ER is 90%, required reserve ratio is RR equals 1 minus ER. And this is what we would get. So we basically get 1 over 0.1, which is equal to 10, multiply that by the 10,000, and we would see that we have created $100,000. So, how does monetary policy work in the U.S.? As I explained how money gets created in the United States. It gets created through lending and lending policies set by the Federal Reserve. But <clears throat> that's obviously not the only way the money supply gets managed. So, how does it work? Well, glad you asked. Okay, maybe you didn't ask. I did. Um big deal, whatever. Maybe it was one of the voices in my head that asked or something. I don't know. Screw them. And I'm just going to pretend that somebody else asked. Totally not the voice in my head. Uh, please, please don't pink slip me. Um, I'm totally saying I promise. Let's assume we got three players here. I'm just kind of totally brushing over all that stuff. The players are, one, the public. Two, the treasury, federal government. Three, monetary authority, the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, treasury gets a spending bill that's been voted on by Congress. We'll say this year's taxes won't cover the budget the government wants, which is kind of an understatement for 2020. So what they have to do is they have to print bonds and then sell them 
with a promise to repay the bond plus some interest rate to sort of, you know, cover your the the inconvenience that you face to give the government your money rather than just, you know, do something that you wanted to do with the money. So they kind of have to pay you back for that, your opportunity cost, so to speak. Now, the interest rate on the bond depends on how long the bond is for and how risky people see the government's ability to pay back its debt. So the Treasury sells the bond to the public. Their role in monetary policy is now completely over. <clears throat> the public holds the government's debt because the government bond has value in the future. Now, because the government seen as risk-free with its lending, the interest rate on these bonds is typically super low. But the more bonds there are in the market, the more debt the government has and the higher the interest rates are, which is kind of seen you know, as not particularly good. One reason it's not good is because it, it crowds out private investment. Private firms can't expand their businesses because interest rates are too high and they don't want to borrow when interest rates are high. Who the hell does? It's not good stuff. This is where the Fed comes in. They look at how the economy is doing overall because they're tasked with trying to manage the economy and keep things as smooth as possible for as long as possible. So they're going to look at output, unemployment, inflation, interest rates, and they can influence the economy through the manipulation of interest rates, namely one key interest rate. Now, they've got a committee that meets called the Federal Open Market Committee. They look over the state of the economy, namely with respect to inflation and unemployment. It's what's referred to as the dual mandate. It's set by Congress. They have to keep unemployment low while trying to stay around some benchmark target inflation rate, which is typically 2%, although I believe uh, from what I have heard, it's set to change relatively soon with the um, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell set to make an announcement maybe today or if not today, sometime later this week about how, quote unquote, the Fed's going to change its views on inflation, which just means they're going to want higher inflation. So they set a goal for a super short term interest rate that's called the federal funds rate. Now, this is the rate that banks will charge one another if they have to borrow reserves from each other overnight. Now, why would they have to do that? Well, remember the required and excess reserve stuff I talked about? Sometimes at the end of business, banks don't have the required reserves necessary to, you know, be able to quote unquote close up shop for the day. So they're like, oh man, you know, we're running really low on these required reserves. Uh, let's go call Bank of America, see if they have any excess reserves. Well, Bank of America does. So what happens is they will lend some of those excess reserves to your bank, but they'll charge you a little bit of an interest rate. Not much, but just enough because they're not really losing much. It's really just an overnight interest rate, but they're going to charge you something. Well, that something is the federal funds rate. If the Federal Reserve buys and sells bonds, what they're doing is they are, let's say they buy a bunch of bonds, they're buying these bonds by creating excess reserves that go to these banks. So if these excess reserves go into the bank's accounts, well, banks have more reserves to lend out. If there are more reserves to lend out, the interest that they would charge is going to fall because, well, you've got more reserves, right? If you have to lend, say, $30 million to a bank and you've got $50 million, you're going to charge a pretty high interest rate. But if you've got $500 million, interest rate's probably not going to be as high. So by controlling the size of the reserves that these banks have, or the amount of these reserves that the banks have, they're influencing this overnight lending rate. And by influencing the overnight lending rate, they ultimately can control the rest of, or not control, but influence the rest of the economy through the manipulation of this one interest rate. It's kind of like that movie Inception where like they go inside the guy's brain and like when he's asleep and they do all sorts of weird stuff to make him think that like this idea they're giving him is his original idea or something. It's kind of a ridiculous movie when you think about it. But it's something kind of along those lines. They're doing this one really small thing that has massive effects throughout the rest of the economy. Now, the way that the federal funds rate, which is an overnight lending rate, really just about the shortest term interest rate you could possibly imagine, the way that would influence other interest rates is through what's known as the term structure of interest rates. As assets increase in their maturity, basically the longer the asset exists for, 
the associated interest rate, interest rate, yeah, sound it out, Jeremy, is also going to rise. The longer you have to borrow, lenders face a higher opportunity cost of holding on to that idle cash, they're going to charge you more because they could have used it for other stuff instead of just giving it to you. But they also have to worry about a higher risk of default. The longer you have something, the higher the probability of defaulting on your debt is going to be. So the longer you borrow, the more opportunities you have to default on your repayments. Now, this term structure is also referred to as the yield curve, and it looks something kind of like this. As we go longer out in the maturity, this little T here is for time. So as time goes out, the length of maturity goes out, the interest rate, R sub T, is going to rise. So overnight lending, low interest rate. 30-year mortgage, higher interest rate. Kind of the way that would sort of work there. So now that we've covered that, we can end class, and I can actually end class fairly early today, which is nice. Uh, looks like we're cutting it to about maybe 27 minutes grand total. Uh, so it's going to wrap up everything about money. I uh, hope you guys have a great day. I uh, hope you enjoyed the first lecture. Uh, we'll kind of get into some more advanced stuff in the next lecture, which will come up in the next day or two. Uh, I believe we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit of math tools that you're going to need. I think the next two chapters are going to be covering the math that's required to be able to do some of the more advanced modeling in this class. But the beauty of doing some of the more advanced modeling is you're going to see what actual macroeconomic research is, which to me is highly important rather than just learning a couple of stylized facts and calling it a class. So uh, with that said, uh, have a great day or night, um, and we will meet later this week. I will have some more stuff, and uh, we'll probably start doing like problem set stuff uh, maybe in a week or two. Um, I don't want to give you a problem set that's just totally useless because, you know, I have to make it, you have to do it, I have to grade it. Not very fun. So we'll just save it until, you know, we get more substantial work coming in soon. So uh, with all that said, enjoy, and uh, I will talk to you later. Peace.